It's another day at TV Recapped, and today, we're going to analyze HBO's television series titled The Nevers. The Nevers is an American science fiction series where Victorian women find themselves with unusual powers to change the world. The message in The Nevers is very blunt when it comes to a symbolic war between the rich white men versus women referred to on the show as Feminine Plague. The series opens with the episode Touched. Three years ago, on August 3, 1896, London residents are startled by a strange noise passing overhead. Meanwhile, Amalia makes her way down a quiet alleyway before leaping off a cobblestone path into the Thames. Amalia wakes up on the floor of St. Romaldus Orphanage, ready for the day ahead. This girl has some serious sleepwalking issues. Penance, who had spent the earlier hours of the morning blacksmithing, follows suit. It's rare to see a lady blacksmith in this time, so kudos to Penance. Although Penance is a talented woman, a woman that stinks is another thing. The two meet in the courtyard and ride in a carriage to the hapless residence, where they have received information about a young girl who may have been touched. Touched, not in a hentai manner. The parents of Myrtle Haplish suspect a satanic element pestering their lovely child. In a brief vision, Amalia finds herself lying on the ground with three young children, a boy and two girls, hovering over her. Amalia and Penance proceed to introduce themselves to Myrtle, who, despite her inability to speak English, understands it. Myrtle is chained like she's some sort of animal. Parents in the 1800s surely need a spanking from social services. She appears to be fluent in Chinese, Russian, and Turkish. No wonder her mother thinks she's Lucifer's vessel. We can see a lot of similarities to the show and what it was like to be called a witch back then. They would treat you as a devil and burn you at the stake. But really, it was about controlling women and protecting the patriarchy. Mrs. Haplish then suspects that she learned Chinese from the park's acrobats. Amalia rushes upstairs to Myrtle after hearing a thud and orders Penance to keep the Haplishes downstairs. She walks into Myrtle's room to find two men grabbing her. One of Myrtle's assailants turns to Amalia and shoves her into the other room. Amalia is on the ground, as predicted in her vision, with a boy and two girls hovering over her. Amalia leaps to her feet as Penance rushes upstairs. She returns to the room and fights Myrtle's kidnappers, throwing one of them out the window. She cracks her neck like she's Bruce Lee and fights the last man standing. Amalia binds his hands before tackling him out the window, and Penance blinds him with her shiner, a tiny explosive device. Outside on the ground floor, she discovers a group of masked men kidnapping Myrtle. Amalia repels them with her electroshock umbrella long enough for Penance to turn the carriage, despite being injured in the fight. One of the assailants looks like he has severe anemia. It's now a chase with one of the masked attackers scaling the carrier. Amalia instructs Penance to activate her auto carriage prototype, allowing them to flee. It's not the best Batmobile, but hey, it'll work. Amalia has a fleeting impression of being at the Opera House, so she intends to visit it. A council meeting is currently in session and they're discussing Malady, who has already claimed five victims. They then talk about the touched and their place in society. Lord Broughton points out that there are hundreds of people suffering from strange, inexplicable illnesses and Lavinia Bidlow has made a cause of them. Lord Alaventine argues that they must take a stand but Prince Albrecht dismisses them as electrically induced biological anomalies. The Prime Minister will not take a position on the touched, according to Lord Masson. He will also not allow any official debate on the subject until they fully comprehend the nature of the attack. Such rigid minds from crinkly old men. He recalls three years ago when the first reports on the touched surfaced. All were in London, mostly female, and not a single man of stature was afflicted, leading him to suspect that the touched were affiliated with these abilities to be used against the Empire. Detective Mundy is summoned to the underground tunnels to look into the death of an unidentified woman. Her body bears stab wounds and rat bites. Yikes! On a nearby wall is a message written in blood. Behold my works, for I am the angle of death. Detective Mundy, on the other hand, does not believe the message is Malady's work, citing her ability to spell correctly. How hard is it to spell angel? He inquires of the foreman who moved the body, claiming that the message was written in the hopes of framing Malady for the murder. Mundy directs that every worker's nails and clothing be checked for blood. He then seizes the foreman and demands to know how he changed the crime scene. Harriet and Anil return the remains of Penance and Amalia's carriage to the orphanage. 
Lucy informs Primrose of their auto carriage deployment, but she responds indifferently, explaining that her mother told her that motor cars are common and a blight. Lucy makes an unwarranted remark about Primrose's absentee mother, to which Primrose responds that Lucy has no idea what it's like to be a mother. Amalia and Penance accompany Myrtle back to the orphanage. Dr. Horatio Cousins welcomes them and asks about their journey. Amalia shows Lucy her wound and tells her to get a pen and paper so she can write to Miss Bidlow about the latest attack. Penance introduces Myrtle to Primrose, who is not only ridiculously tall but also eager to make friends with someone her own age. She requests that Primrose take Myrtle to the kitchen to get a cup of tea. Meanwhile, Harriet and Anil take a seat inside the auto carriage and decide to marry there. Horatio, Lucy, and Harriet witness Amalia and Penance's encounter with the masked attackers. Amalia suspects that the masked men have been tracking the touched for some time, which would explain all of the alleged just ran away touched girls. Having said that, they will be beefing up their security in the future to protect the touched in their care. Lucy has been teaching some of the girls self-defense. Amalia would like her to extend this to everyone, showing the girls how to defend themselves without using their turns. Finally, Amalia wishes to contact the Beggar King, whom they pay for protection and knowledge of potential candidates. Amalia must confirm whether or not he has shared this information with anyone else. Hugo awakens in bed with a man to his right and a woman to his left. He meets with Augustus, who has taken notice of the crows outside Hugo's house. They are unhappy and massing nearby. More importantly, he's come to talk about his sister and her charity for the touched and the orphanage. Augustus tells Hugo that Lavinia has just received word that a young touched girl was attacked but is now safe. And now, Lavinia is taking Amalia and Penance to the opera. Hugo wonders if they're hideous and advises Augustus to flirt with the ugly one to create an unexpected balance. Augustus is hoping that Hugo will agree to accompany him to the opera and coach him through the evening. Hugo initially declines Augustus because he has a meeting with the Minister of Finance about the Ferryman's Club's next midnight carouse. However, he reluctantly agrees on the condition that Augustus attends the Ferryman's. Hugo watches Augustus interact with the crows from the window above after he leaves. Hugo says that Augustus is above reproach and beneath contempt when the maid joins him. Horatio uses his turn to treat Amalia's wound. She tells him that with his talent, he should be a royal physician rather than patching up gangsters and freaks. However, Horatio's transformation has earned him the label of a voodoo witch doctor in the eyes of many. Myrtle interrupts with a dress and an invitation to the opera from Lavinia Bidlow. That evening, Amalia and Penance leave the orphanage for the opera house. Declan Oren, the beggar king, joins them inside their carriage as they come to a sudden halt. He introduces them to his new henchman, Odium, a large and smelly man by the window. Declan informs Amalia that there are procedures she must follow in order to contact him. She tells him about the attack on Myrtle Haplish and her suspicion that the masked attackers have been tracking the touched for some time. They pose a threat to the touched and anyone new to be associated with them, which Amalia has made Declan aware of, forcing him to assist them. Amalia wonders if Declan sold Myrtle's information to anyone else. Except for his marriage, he says nothing is exclusive. Amalia requires the name of whoever is hunting the touched and why for a fee of his choosing. They offer him an automated motor carriage as a gift for today and payment if he assists them. Declan pulls a blade from his pocket and threatens to kill Amalia if she does not keep her end of the bargain. As they leave, she tells him that this isn't her face, which perplexes him. When one of his henchmen laughs, the Beggar King orders that he spread his fingers wide. Amalia and Penance make their way to the opera house. Inside the theater, Lavinia and the others debate ancient prejudices and the nuances of modern languages, such as the distinction between the employed and employee. Amalia and Penance join them, and the conversation shifts to their afflictions, a term Amalia refuses to accept as applicable to the touched. During the opera, the audience screams when Malady appears out of nowhere and slits the throat of an actor dressed as the devil. Bonfire and Weinmar Cruz accompany her. Malady tells one of the actresses that it is the doctor's fault, not hers. 
Amalia has a brief vision of Malady attacking her from the balcony. Malady then declares that she has come to kill an angel witch, but as she gets closer, she realizes that she is there for a reason. She claims to have seen God, who places his wreath on her while they turn away from him. She adds that he sings, but she can't hear him despite feeling his presence. Melody's henchman fires into the crowd, killing Doctor and Mrs. Belden and scattering the audience. Mary, one of the stage performers, begins to sing as Bonfire creates a fireball. Melody and several others, including Amalia, Penance, and Augustus, are drawn to her voice. Melody screams out the back with Mary and Bonfire covering the singer's mouth. Amalia descends several flights of stairs to confront Melody. Melody's eyes begin to glow orange as a result of the fight. She strikes Amalia repeatedly, but when the cops arrive, Melody and Bonfire flee with Mary. Hugo discusses the theater attack with Detective Mundy. Hugo says they know the abducted girl. Inspector Mundy doesn't profit from their nefarious business dealings. Hugo says the ferryman's club will become a phenomenon once he has enough girls and a certain investor is interested. Dr. Haig complains to the masked man who brought him Myrtle. Every subject brings him closer to determine whether they're touched. Dr. Haig brutally inserts a drill into the man's wounded skull who screams. Penance follows a commotion down an alley to find Amalia fighting two drunk men. She tells Penance she lost Mary to Melody, but she thinks Melody won't kill her immediately. Penance remembers Mary's voice. It confirmed her and everyone touched belongings. Penance assures Amalia that if they find Mary and sing, the others will come. In 1896, a crystalline object emerges from the clouds and emits bright exhaust. It falls on Amalia, Penance, Horatio, Malady, Mary, Augustus, and Lord Masson's daughter. All witnesses except Malady forget what happened when the object vanishes. Amalia opens her eyes, pulls herself from the river, and lays down. And that's it for today's recap. See you later! Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.